Let's narrow the search a little bit and combine that with Jenny. Now, if you make that search, you started again at the beginning here. A week ago, I was sitting at a small, sticky table outside a cafe in San Jose. It was my day off, and I was writing in the blue notebook. It was a gray, overcast day, not quite warm enough to be sitting outside. The coffee was good. There was a jelly donut on a paper plate in front of me. I was writing about a trip I took with David last year. The things I wrote in the blue notebook didn't happen in exactly the way I wrote them. David's apartment was one big room with a bathroom on one side and a very small kitchen on the other side. David never made his bed and he always kept his clothes on the floor. The floor of his apartment was covered with dirty clothes and empty food wrappers. Photos of people's picnics, weddings, and vacations were tapped all over the walls. David worked in a 24-hour photo processing store and he took home the pictures that he liked. I put on cut off the dungarees and a sleeveless blue shirt. Sure. Sally rubbed against my legs. David had built a castle of cat food cans on the kitchen floor. I opened a can and gave her some. He was standing by the window pulling on his pants. It was a Monday morning in the middle of July and he was already late for work. I peeled an orange and went to the window. We were standing by the window eating pieces of the orange when we looked out and saw the blimp over the square. It was a large silver blimp with no writing on it. Attached to the bottom of the blimp was a huge photograph of Henry Kissinger. I think we should go to the lake, said David. I put some things that were in David's refrigerator in a plastic bag. We put the plastic bag, some clothes that were on the floor, David's sleeping bag, his camera, and Sally into his old black Buick. The only door that opened was on the passenger side because a steamroller had run into the driver's side. We got into the car and started driving north. We were headed for a place on the edge of a lake in northern New Hampshire where David kept his boat. Do you have any money, he asked. Only about five dollars, I said. He reached into his back pocket, pulled out his wallet, and handed it to me. See if I've got any, he said. David had over fifty dollars in his wallet. In his side pocket was a picture of Linda. I took it out and looked at it. She was wearing a white sundress and her long red hair was blowing around her face. David was looking at the road. I tore the picture into little pieces and put it back in the pocket of his wallet. You have about fifty dollars, I said. <laughs> now, at this point, because we're going to stop, we could finish the story and see what happened. It would be interesting, but we're going to stop and take another path. Let's put Uncle Roger in the bathroom. And as in the case of much electronic literature, there are many stories happening at once stored inside the computer. So you have to read quite a lot before you put the whole story together. We won't get that far today. Uncle Roger. Let's put Uncle Roger in the bathroom. How long can we keep the room? Rose whispered to Jack. I needed to go to the bathroom. I followed green and pink carpeted corridors until I opened the door to the ladies' room. Inside, the walls were distressed pink and the tiles on the floor were the color of mountain stone. Uncle Roger was lying on the couch drinking a margarita. This is the ladies' room, Uncle Roger, I said. I know, he said. I've been waiting to talk with you. There was no one in the ladies' room except Uncle Roger and me. Uncle Roger finished his margarita. He set the empty glass on a chrome shelf under the green board boarded mirror. He said, your father asked me to watch over you. I'm going to skip a few screens so we get to some of the more main part of the story, which any reader could do any time. I dropped the soap. It clattered loudly on the tile floor. I want to talk with you, Uncle Roger said. Jeff, I said, feeling the color rise in my cheeks as I turned to face Uncle Roger in the ladies' room of the restaurant. Uncle Roger reached into his pocket and pulled out a small chip. It was less than an inch long, covered with colored ridges and gold lines. What's that? I asked. It's a knockoff of the chip Jeff designed and Tom stole, he said. There was a piece of rice stuck between his front teeth. Uncle Roger handed me the chip. I grasped it tentatively. He reached down, picked up the soap, and put it in his pocket. I heard footsteps in the corridor. Let's talk somewhere else, I said. How about in here, he said, stepping into one of the toilet stalls. 
Frog fur was hung up in the process, and I've got a million of them coming off the line in Haiti, Uncle Roger. Uncle Roger was dancing around in the toilet stall, humming, fast, fast, softly to himself. I could see his black shoes and brown socks moving on the pink tile floor. But Uncle Roger, isn't that illegal, I asked. You don't understand the semiconductor business, my dear child. He flushed the toilet. I think I'm in love with Jeff, I said. There's a nice young stockbroker in our San Francisco office I want you to meet, said Uncle Roger. And by the way, I've arranged for you to start work there next week. Now, perhaps that's enough and we should finish off with a few screens from terminals. Do we sure. have enough? OK. Stop. Let's see what happens when we turn to stop. OK. We're going to clear this out here. Stop. Uncle Roger. OK. To exit Uncle Roger, let's stop completely. And you get a final screen. 1986 to 88, 1988, Gene Malloy. Uncle Roger first appeared on Arcom Electronic Network, ACEN, on the well. The ACEN data Nate version of Blue Notebook, the Blue Notebook, was funded by the California Arts Council and Art Matters. Okay?